Uh, Jane and I are both trained as GPs. Um, I, used, I trained at Fremantle Hospital, but we left the medical system in 2007. The reason we did that is because we saw that it was dominated by pharmacies, pharmaceuticals and the government. And, <laughs> and we were, but the, the, the convictions were deeper than that. And it was actually that we're heading to a time of international global financial tyranny that's going to get everybody to take digital IDs and have vaccine passports and have their buying and selling regulated and people are heading towards a time when they are um, unable to buy and sell without what people call the mark or the name of the number of the beast. Does anybody understand that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Joan and I totally left the system in 2011. We don't even have a government registered identity. We changed our identities without asking the government. I wrote to the Queen, the Governor, the Magistrates, the, um, the births, deaths and marriages and said I've got a new name. I said uh, I'll be driving with these plates and this, uh, this identification. Please let me know if there's a problem with it, Your Majesty. I, I want to respect those that are in authority. I don't want to be rebellious. I am not here to overthrow government, but I can't serve the New World Order or the democratic system. So we stepped out of our home with less than a dollar, three girls, no house, no car, no job, no bank account, no government assistance, and we're still on the earth, and that was in 2011. The reason I tell you all that is because I don't have a card in the pack, I don't have a, a horse in the race. I don't, I'm, I'm not a professor of physics, I haven't made my money through promoting science. In fact, when I heard about all this and Cathy said, could you do a talk on a flat earth, I had to go, man, I don't remember any high school physics or medical physics or anything like that. What I, I came to, to this topic saying what well, could be flowed, like they could have been taught wrong when I went through medical school, because I was about evolution. And I was about pharmaceuticals and how they were better than nutraceuticals and vitamin C is much better than steroids, for example. Like I've learnt these things. So, and I also know that the Twin Towers were blown up and they weren't like, the molly, uh, you know, yeah. it was a purposeful demolition. So the thing is, I'm somebody who sees all these errors in the world, like banking conspiracy and the fact that we're all uh, on a road to, to just uh, chaos. I mean, the whole world's falling apart. And I came back to this and said, well, it could be another thing that I've been deceived with, but I had to go back to basics. So I'm going to try and identify with you as people that have had some education at school or at universities or whatever, but are trying to brush up and go, oh, I don't know, it's like everything else seems to have gone sort of south. So I'm going to come from an area where we're going to have a look at a couple of things, these, these are big words, yes, I had to look them up too to go, well, what is ontology and what is epistemology? Ontology is the study of what is. What is reality? And that's a question we have a difficulty getting our heads around in a day of deception. What is reality? Um, and there we have the, the interface between belief and knowledge. I might believe many things, but are they true? I can even have a, a true belief. But I can truly believe that some, I, I could have like a, truly believe that it's three o'clock in the afternoon and I might walk into a room and I might see a clock that says it's three in the afternoon. But although I've got a belief that it's three o'clock and the clock says three o'clock, if the clock has stopped four hours ago, I don't know if my true belief in the clock is actually right. So the question is, what is true knowledge? Epistemology is, how do I know what I believe is true? It's the study of knowledge. Now, we all use our senses and our reason all the time. We've got the five senses. And we use various evidences to create what we uh, call knowledge. We, when we have evidence in a court of law, we can have circumstantial evidence. But more powerful than, than that, and that's why I've got it in bold, is eyewitness evidence. You can have a crime scene with certain you know, blood and bullet holes on the walls and stuff like that. But if you've got eyewitnesses, and many of them, they far outweigh the evidence of circumstance that you, you know, have to put things together to say what happened. Also, when you have testimonies, you have individual testimonies, people that say, well, I saw this, or I've done that. But when you've got universal evidence that everybody sees it, it's far more weighty. So the three things I'm going to appeal to today are eyewitness evidence, universal testimony and your reason. The Bible says, come let us reason together. And we have been given, Christ says, a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. 
So we don't want to be nutty. And everybody, you know, people say that science, and people will quote the scripture that says, and oppositions of science falsely so called. Hands up if you use that scripture to say, well, all science is bunkum or, or refute some scientific argument, and that science refutes the Bible. I've heard people do that. Science refutes the Bible. But you use science. If, if you believe in a flat earth, you, you watch videos of people that make experiments over lakes and vast distances with lasers and Nikon P900 cameras, and they will say, well, given that the Earth's curvature is this and I can see this, science says this. They're doing an experiment. And we all must do that. If you were the only person on the face of the planet and you wanted to discover something about your environment, it could be about temperature and fire, you could melt some objects and say, well, okay, this object melts at this temperature and this object melts at this temperature. You'd be using observational science and everybody has to do it. It's just part of being human. I live in a world that is understandable. The question is, what model best explains my world? And that's what we're looking at today. Now, eyewitness testimony, like I said, is far more powerful than circumstantial evidence. If we were to have a court here and the judge was sitting up on the stage, and we had various people appear before the judge, and I, there was somebody here who said, look, I've seen a YouTube video, and on the YouTube video, there was a guy who zoomed in his camera across a lake and he could see something that should have been beyond the curvature of the earth. The judge would say, yeah, okay, well, that's important. But then if somebody says, well, look, I've been on the International Space Station and I took a whole lot of photographs and um, I've actually compiled a bang of them and here they are and I'm actually going to present it to you as an eyewitness, I, I think you would have a bit more um, evidence than, than the circumstantial evidence. So I'm going to present that to you now for what it's worth. Just one guy. It's just one part of the evidence, but uh, yeah, this is uh, one part of the evidence. But the majority of evidence that I want to present to you today is things that you have observed every day and will tell you, if you have eyes to see it, that the Earth is a sphere. So here we go. So in the early morning hours in the spring of 2000, Jeff embarked on his first space flight in what was described then as the most spectacular shuttle launch in its history. With Jeff launched a copy of the MacArthur Study Bible and a personal relationship with Grace to You that has deepened and widened significantly in the decades since. In his two subsequent flights to the International Space Station, Jeff again took Grace to You along with him, flying mementos for the staff conducting live video conferences with us and making several long, 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 long distance phone calls <laughs> to our offices. After returning to Earth, he was featured on Grace to You Radio in an interview with John MacArthur. He has spoken at several conferences, including one here at Grace Church. Most recently, the focus of his presentations has been photography from his 2006 mission. During that six-month flight, he took an astounding number of photographs of the Earth, more than any astronaut in history. The best of the best became the foundation for the compelling presentation you're about to experience. Please welcome Colonel Jeffrey Williams. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jay, for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, it almost uh, took my train of thought away, especially reflecting back on the initial contact we had with uh, the ministry and, and the response and, and uh, the honor to, to get to know the folks out here, not only John himself but, uh, and his family, but uh, the staff at Grace to You. Um, Jay went to the, that shuttle flight that he mentioned. He also traveled along with a couple other folks on staff to the uh, Mission Control Center in Houston for the uh, Soyuz launches that came subsequently. I think uh, you would agree with me that the theme of, uh, a theme anyway, and, and perhaps the, uh, the common theme of a Christian life is, should be, and usually is, if uh, you are like I think you are, and that is dedicated to, the, to God's Word and to knowing Him through how He has revealed Himself, the theme of the Christian life is gratitude. And um, Jay reflected on that a little bit, and I know that uh, this room is full of folks that are 
experiencing and live out gratitude, a life of gratitude. Let gratitude uh, to our Savior for His grace that we've heard so eloquently um, both last night and today, as well as gratitude for the faithful uh, work of God's instruments in the um, making the truth of His Scripture plain to us, making sense of it. And up behind me, you often think about some of the Psalms, perhaps Psalm 8 is one that's uh, very familiar to us. The entire Psalm is, is uh, incredible. Uh, you know it from uh, perhaps the verse, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man that you care for Him. I encourage you as homework to go read that entire psalm, especially after this presentation. Psalm 19 is another incredible psalm that talks about God's revelation. The first few verses talk about His natural revelation uh, that you're going to view here. And then in the middle of the psalm, uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard John's teaching on Psalm 19, talks about His special revelation in the character of God's Word. I encourage you to use uh, that psalm as homework as well. Psalm 104 is a, is a great psalm that details God's creative power and sustaining power in the provision that He gives His creatures. Psalm 139, I think was, might have been mentioned already in the conference, is one that gives great comfort to us. It's a very personal psalm. So all those psalms, 8, 19, 104, 139, I'm not going to spend any time in today, but I encourage you to go read them after this uh, presentation. Now, in order to give you a glimpse of the wonders of God's creation from this vantage point that I'm talking about, I need to give you a perspective of what the vantage point is. So imagine yourself on the International Space Station. It's traveling 17,500 miles an hour, orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. If you were to ride on a rocket and get there, you'd get to orbit in about nine minutes, and then uh, typically it would take you about two days to catch up and dock with the thing, and then this place is your home. It's about the size of a on the inside, a large five-bedroom home. Um, it's got a few windows, thankfully. That's the best part to be able to view the earth. But imagine yourself there. Imagine yourself going outside perhaps once in a while and hanging on to the outside and viewing um, God's creation. We call it earth down below. I call this the ultimate skydive. <laughs> of course, visitors from earth every now and then, they, they were good. They bring... Uh, um, beads and trinkets from home and cards and letters and fresh fruit and vegetables. This is a story I'm, uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes on. This is a, a volcano, and you can see the entire plume right there. This is one of the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. It was six weeks into a six-month uh, expedition on board the space station, and by the way, we have good contact with the ground. Anna Marie and I talked every day, typically twice a day. So we stayed in touch uh, uh, very regularly, uh, and six weeks into that six-month mission, I was having a kind of a bad day. Six months or six weeks had been a long time, and six months was way over my horizon. You know, you couldn't see the end. So she knew that; she was aware of that. And there was uh, at the time there was only two of us on board: Pavel Vinogradov and I, my Russian crewmate, and I. Um, and uh, we were pretty busy on the space station. We were usually at opposite ends, so we were usually by ourselves. But I'd go back to the, the, after the back end of the space station where he typically was and occasionally have a, a bag of tea. We drink bags or tea out of a, through a straw out of a bag. Um, and uh, have a tea with him and uh, chit-chat a little bit and then go back forward and go about my business. Well, I did that as was my habit uh, one day. And then as I was heading forward, I... Uh, floated over a couple windows, saw uh, out the windows that we were going over some islands. So as was my habit, I grabbed the camera, got in the window, started taking pictures of the island. So I went one island, the next island, the next island, and then I got to this one, went one more, and something in the back of my head said, hey, there's something different there. So I went back to, to this one and got off uh, three or four pictures, saw that, you know, it was erupting. It was a fresh eruption because you could see the entire plume in the, in the view. I uh, was pretty excited about that. Uh, took that forward, got on the radio, called Houston Mission Control, said, hey, I just uh, saw a, a newly erupting volcano. I thought you'd like to know this. I got some pictures. I'll send them down. We can send them down electronically. Um, and uh, so they could hear the excitement in my voice, and I think that excited the, the team down there uh, in Houston. Uh, the uh, Capcom that was on duty, Steve Bowen, he was uh, uh, 
um, took the initiative to get on uh, the internet and he, he Googled the uh, Alaskan Volcano Observatory, got their phone number, called them up, said, hey, this is Steve Bowen calling from Mission Control down in Houston. We just got a report from one of our astronauts in the International Space Station that one of your volcanoes is erupting. <laughs> and um, the scientist said he got on, on, uh, on the phone. She had in her voice the uh, obvious um, um, uh, communication that she wasn't quite buying this. Surely this was a prank club. But he, um, he kept talking to her, assuring her that this was true and whatnot. And uh, they finished their, their phone conversation. And I'm not sure how, what she had concluded at the end of that. But at any rate, he sent me her name and phone number. So I called her up. <laughs> and uh, this was still in the, the orbit after... Um, you know, before we'd gone around, because I was, I had set my stopwatch or my alarm uh, to ring just prior to going over it again, because we'd have one more opportunity to see it 90 minutes later. So I called her up and uh, identified myself. And if you get a call from the space station, there's a lag in the communication. So there's a couple of seconds there and a lag. And so it's probably hard to get used to at first. So she knew there was something unique there, but I could tell in her voice that she still wasn't quite buying into this prank. Uh, but later on, she got the picture. She knew it was all in the up and up, and I guess that whole organization up there was pretty excited about that. And I went on about my business. The, the alarm went off for the 90-minute later pass, and uh, I got in the window. Both Pavel and I got in the window, and there it was. And uh, so the, the cloud had detached from the volcano already, and it was, uh, it was way downwind, um, so it was done. So I saw that, and you can see the fresh lava, by the way, flowing down there. This is a volcano they call Cleveland. You can look it up as well. Um, so I saw this as a unique provision of God to bring me out of my slump. And oh, by the way, it was a direct answer to Anna Marie's prayer for me because she knew what I needed. So just absolutely incredible. Now, the first time we passed by it, Pavel wasn't in the window, so he missed it. So I figure I'm the only guy on the planet or off the planet that saw that particular <laughs> eruption, and God gave it to me for a, as a special provision. Dan, I thought that was a neat story because there's a lot of nuance to it. Calls to his wife, I floated over the window. Like he just says it, I just floated over the window and I happened to see this. He used the word float. He doesn't speak as a guy that's trying to make up a story. It's got all the, the nuance of a, a quirky event that happened in your day, like when you go to the shops and you, you, know, you meet your long lost cousin that you haven't seen for 10 years. It's got all that kind of, I didn't make this up element to it. And so I would call him a credible witness. But obviously we've all got to make our own minds up and that's what we're trying to encourage people to do today, to make your own mind up, obviously. I'm just going to go through the... Um, Gideon's gone through a lot of the scriptures. And the, the, the thing with the Bible that I've discovered as I've gone through the scriptures is there are certain scriptures that people that believe in a flat earth will say, hey, look, um, you know, the Lord sits above the circle of the earth. And they say, look, it's a circle. But you know what? I got a text from somebody or an email from somebody saying, of course it's a globe. The Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. And they saw that the circle meant a globe. So, in a sense, the ones that script, uh, Gideon has mentioned, both people that are flat earthers and globe earthers, can contend over them. And as I've looked at all the scriptures, I found it doesn't comprehensively tell us that it's either global or flat. In fact, it might be neither because it's got pillars. So it might be like a, it's a high rise building. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, scripture because Gideon's already touched on it and I don't want to go over things that Gideon's already done. When you get on the internet, has anybody been through this raft of videos where you've got the, the war of the Nikon P900s? Has anybody seen that? Yeah, zooming so. in? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> the Nikon P900 is the super duper zoom in camera. It's now got a P1000 which goes even further. But people on the globe earth side will say, hey look, my, my P900 shows me that there's clearly a curvature on this particular lake and the structure that's built upon it. And other people will look at the Chicago sh uh, skyline from 50 odd kilometres away and say, hey, look, you can still see that it should be hidden behind the curvature of the earth. Now, other people get lasers on lakes 
and they will say, look, the laser, you can get it 30 k's up the lake and it hits it, you know, it's only one or two metres off the, the, the ground. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, the laser experiments. Other people, for example, the Rainy Lake experiment will do the, the same 10 kilometre observations and they will have targets and they say, allowing for the cur curvature of the earth, bang on. And you've all seen the disappearing boat, boat videos. You know, some people say, well, if you zoom in again, then the boat comes back into view and you can see the hole. Other people say, look, if you zoom in, you still can't see the hole. And they'll say, you silly flat earther and, and be derogatory. So you end up in this pendulum going, what? That one it looked like it was flat. And that one, well, this one's going to be around. And you'll get stuck in the pendulum. The difficulty there is there's a lot of variability in these observations because of atmospheric refraction now. Uh, uh, any mechanics here? I know Jamie was here earlier, he's a mechanic. You know you diff at the guys, talking to you now, you've got to diff in your car, so that when you go around the corner, the, 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 the tyres can turn at different speeds, otherwise you'd have to drift when you went around the corner. Okay, so when light goes in different media, so you've got your left wheel stuck in the mud, your right wheel goes quicker, right? It's the same with light. Light slows down when it goes through denser media. Now we know that hot air rises and therefore the lightest air is at the top and the heaviest air is at the bottom. Where are most of the um, observations made? They're made over water. And the air over water is cooler and the hot air will be higher. So you're going to get a curving like this over, over water because the, the, the left wheel is going slower than the right wheel. So there's a turn there, right? Now, atmospheric refraction can vary a lot. It can be very little or a lot. And people that do optics and, and optics over long areas, they actually allow for a standard coefficient of refraction under normal circumstances. And it's very variable. Other things is atmospheric visibility will change. There's a lot of observer error, the study design, image resolution, observer bias. And that's the biggest one. People will see what they want to see. So I'm not going to get into this debate over the Nikon P900s. What I'm going to, I'm going to address some simple topics, line of sight issues, eclipses, just very briefly. I'm going to talk about days and months and tides and things that you and I know and can see. I'm going to talk about the northern and southern celestial hemispheres. I'm going to talk about the rotation of the, 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 the stars. And I'm just going to briefly touch on the International Space Station, but... I think I don't really need to because Gideon already covered that. Okay. Universal observations. If you're up the top of a mountain and the sun is setting, you will see the sun for longer than if you're at the bottom of the mountain. True? Okay. And if you want to see a sunrise, nice and healthy, you go up to the top of a mountain. Everybody knows it. Okay. And that's because there's a line of sight with well, the line of light issue. The, 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 the curvature of the Earth is blocking out the bottom of the, moon, uh, the, the mountain and the top is in the light. This is a book that I just happened to read last week. I wasn't looking at this. was a completely different topic on a guy that had a near-death experience, but he wrote this. He, was a, a, he loved parachuting. The best jumps were often made in the afternoon when the sun was starting to sink beneath the horizon. It's hard to describe the feeling I would get on those jumps. On our penultimate, that's the second last jump of the day, out of a D-18 Beechcraft at 10,500 feet, we made a 10-man snowflake. By this time, we hit the by the time we hit the ground, the sun was down. But by hustling into another plane, that should say, and taking off again quickly, we managed to get back up into the last of the sun's rays and do a second sunset jump. That's just telling us that it's possible to go up and see more of the sun than that you had when you're on the ground. Just a common observation. Can you, is there any way? See, when we have observations like this, we have to test them. And if somebody could explain to me, and I, I don't want them to do it now because I don't want to get into a discussion and time is short, how can we explain that on a flat earth model? That you could go down, see the sunset, go back up and see it set again. But on a round earth, it's very easy because it's gone beneath the curvature of the earth. And when you go up, you raise yourself above that line of sight and you see it a second time. 
Okay, eclipses. The sun is a large object. The moon is a small object. And therefore, the shadow that if you, if you have a large light source on a small object, you will create a conical shadow which just happens to track at the certain distance from the Earth to drive a, a little path of eclipse like we saw going up and over Exmouth last week. That's actually what the globe Earth and the heliocentric model predicts that we've got a large sun with a small moon seeing a small track go over the Earth. Did anybody see the path of the eclipse? It went up the west coast, went over Exmouth, went across the top of the northwest corner of Western Australia and up toward Indonesia. And that was it. It was just very brief. And Exmouth was the only place that pretty much saw it um, from land. On the other hand, if you've got a larger Earth, the Earth's here, this, this ball here, and a smaller moon, on a lunar eclipse you will have the whole moon shadowed. And that's what you see. In a lunar eclipse, basically, you'll see the whole moon eclipsed. Lunar eclipses are difficult because people have to explain, well, what is causing that shadow upon the moon? And people will say, well, it's red and shadows are dark. But that's just because the light's being refracted through the Earth's atmosphere. That's what creates its redness. Okay, the question is, okay, well, maybe the Earth is still flat, but the question I, I, I put to you is this. How do people get it so right? The people that predict the path of the, um, the solar eclipse that we've just had. They said that it would go up the west coast, across Exmouth and over the northwest <coughs> shelf at 11.29 on the 22nd or whatever it was. How did they get it so right? Now the question I've got for you is, out of the people that do you know, observational science and astronomy and, and make these maps, how many of them believe in a flat earth? And how many of them believe in a global Earth model? I would say 99.999999% of them believe in a global Earth model. The question is, if the model's wrong, how did they get it so right? So that people could stand there with all the cameras poised and ready to go and say it's going to be now. And they were all there at exactly the right time in exactly the right place. Okay. This is from a, a, a website of somebody who believes that the Earth is flat. And they, they put this argument forward. This is a guy called Nick Haddock. And he says the, the Earth makes a full rotation every 24 hours. After six months, for example, let's say the sun is there. 24 hours, I go around fully. And I keep doing that for six months. After six months, if I keep doing one full rotation, I'm going to be facing away from the sun at midday. 24 hours. 24 hours, 24 hours, midday, 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 midday. But now I'm going to be facing away from the sun. That's what he's saying here. Night will become day and day will become night. But the thing is, what we actually observe is that, and this is important, if you were to set a spot, let's say the zenith, right above you in the sky, and give it the time it takes for a star to go completely around in one day and to come back to the zenith, the star would take 23 minutes and 56 minutes. Uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes. If you were to do the same thing with the sun, and you were to go the sun all the way around to the zenith, it takes 24 hours. There's a four minute difference. And that's what Nick Havoc doesn't understand. And I'm, I'm about to explain it to you. Gideon touched on it. A sidereal day is a... Uh, hang on, here we go. I've got a picture of it. There it is. Right. Here, uh, Gideon, have you got your pointer? Just press the button. That's a boomerang one, that one. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Here's the Earth here, noon on day one facing the sun. But it's also beyond the sun, pointing to a distant star over here. The next day, it moves a bit further to point to the same distant star, and it's rotated 360 degrees. That 360 degree rotation takes 23 hours and 56 minutes to go one full rotation. 
But then to line up so that the moon is overhead, it has to go an extra one degree so that the moon is overhead and that takes four minutes. The question is, why is it four minutes? How many, how many days in a year? 365. Um, each day, because it has to get, it takes 365 days to come back to here. There's 300, 360 uh, degrees in a circle. So basically one degree per, 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 um, per, per day. Per day. Per day. That's right. You got it. Okay. Now, if you divide the number of uh, minutes in a day by 360, you're going to get four minutes. And that's why. So when you actually, do, and I did this, I did the math and I said, in fact, here's the math here. There it is. Why is a solar day four minutes longer than a sidereal day? As the Earth rotates one 360 fifths around the Sun, there is an extra rotation necessary. One 360 fifth of 360 degrees is 0.986 degrees. In one hour, the Earth rotates 15 degrees, and 0.9863 out of 15 is 0 0.065 hours. 0 0.065 hours times 60 minutes is 3.9452 minutes which is basically four minutes. So I could do the math. But there's a dummy that doesn't do astrophysics and I can see why a sidereal day is four minutes shorter than a solar day. And everybody can see it. It's just an observational fact. Humankind has figured this out by looking at it. Okay, there's another observation that you can make. Tides, is anybody a fisherman or a boater? Okay, tides are not 24 hours apart or there's two high tides in a day and two low tides in a day but they're not exactly 24 hours apart. They're slightly more than 24 hours apart. In fact, it's about 24 minutes and 50 minutes to do two high tides. Why is a tidal day 50 minutes longer? Because the moon rotates eastward around the Earth every 27.3 days. The Earth's rotating to the east and the moon rotates to the east. So the Earth, the Earth rotates, it goes 24 hours, but then it's got to catch up to the moon again. And it's got to go another... 13 degrees, there it is there, to catch up to the moon, to get the moon overhead. And that takes 50 minutes. I'll give you a diagram of it. Uh, where is it? There it is. Earth going round. It's catching up to the moon. It's 24 hours and it has to go a little bit further. See, so you've got a, a low tide as it's at 90 degrees, a high tide, which is when it's at 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees, and it has to go a little bit further. So that explains your tides, and that's verifiable. Now, it's not exactly 12 hours and 25 minutes between high tides. There's variability because of ocean currents, because of landforms, because of all kinds of things, but that's something that we can observe. And it actually... Like, you can actually figure out the math and figure out that's why it is. And this is what I've learned, because I went right back to basics. I've spent weeks going, oh, I've got to do this presentation and I've got to figure this out. But this is what I've learned as I've gone along. You could do it too. Okay, the visibility of stars. Anybody from Australia ever seen the Big Dipper or the North Star, Polaris? Tell you that down the Royals Joe, the Big Dipper. <laughs> the Big Dipper down the Royal Show. <laughs> I didn't yeah. go on it, though. Okay. Too let's, let's take, let's take the, 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 the flat Earth model, and I'm, I, you know, there's many models, but let's say this is it. If you're on the landmass at the base here, the line of sight from any point on the base is clear to every point on the dome. You can see, you can draw a straight line between any point on the base and every point on the dome. So theoretically, given enough visibility, you should be able to see every object in the sky. There's nothing in the way. But nobody below the equator has seen, probably a little below the equator because of other things, but generally below the equator you can't see the North Star. In the Southern Hemisphere, you can't see the North Star, but people up the top can't see the Southern Cross. A big globe. 
The North Star is not visible south of the Earth's equator. That is a matter, matter of, I would say, universal observational fact. For observers in temperate regions of the Southern Hemisphere, there is a circumpolar region surrounding the North Celestial Pole that is never visible. This region contains the North Star, the Big Dipper, and the Little Dipper. Dipper. My contention is that fits a, a, a global Earth model better than a flat Earth and vice versa, the north can't see the south uh, circumpolar region. Okay, the south southern celestial hemisphere rotates clockwise from our perspective around the south celestial pole, which is near the southern cross constellation. Alpha Crucis, the southernmost star in the southern cross, is within 27 degrees of the south celestial pole, meaning that it is not visible farther north than 27 degrees north latitude. Now, um, I'm also going to address this, the midnight sun. When you're in Antarctica, and there's the 24-hour day, basically between, say, January and about March or April, the sun doesn't set, by and large. And it will rotate across your hemisphere in a, let me get this right, a leftward direction. It will go this way around your horizon. In the northern hemisphere, it will proceed in a rightward direction. And I'm going to show you videos of all these things. First of all, the moving stars of the Northern Hemisphere. So this is looking at the east from the north, the stars rising. What's going to be most interesting is when we look north. Because we'll be looking at the circumpolar region, and I want you to notice which way it rotates, you can already see it. Okay, we're looking north now. Polaris, which is the, uh, the north star, is that one there, I think. Guessing. I don't know, I'm guessing. Where is it? Is that one thing? Oh, it's over here. Okay, so it's rotating counterclockwise in the north. Okay, just keep that in mind. Okay, looking north of Polaris, the stars were rotating counterclockwise. Okay, now let's look south at the, at the um, southern hemisphere. You can already say we can see which way it's rotating, can't you? So all celestial objects rise in the east and they all sink in the west. Okay, there's the south. There's not actually one particular star that's easy to see at the south celestial pole. It's uh, largely an empty space, but there are stars there. You've just got to really zoom in to see them. But you'll see it's rotating what? Clockwise. Okay, 
rotate, so stars rotate around the south celestial pole clockwise, stars in the northern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. Okay. The question is, does that fit a global Earth better or a flat Earth better? Let's, flat Earth. Sorry? Flat Earth. Okay, let's work with a flat Earth. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to put this down. So we've got a flat Earth, and in the flat Earth model, the North Pole is dead in the middle, right? Above, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, everybody agreed on that, on the flat Earth model? South doesn't actually exist as a direction. It's all around the perimeter. Okay, so if we go, and we're standing under the North Pole, and we're looking up, we should see a counterclockwise rotation of the stars above us. Agreed? Counterclockwise, that's what we saw. Now, if I look south, whichever direction that could be, I'm now looking at the edge of the dome, I'm <coughs> going to see a clockwise, sorry, I've got to get this right, clockwise rotation of the stars in the southern hemisphere. So north, I've got an, a counterclockwise, and south, I've got a clockwise. So this is going this way. Where's the, where's the meeting point where these stars going this way meet the stars going that way? There should be a big crunch in the sky where there's a, a mix of rotations. Do we see that in the sky anywhere over the Earth? No. No. Okay. <laughs> this is a video in the Arctic of the 24-hour sun. Now, the sun is moving to the right. This person is uh, probably up in Norway or something like that. They've taken a time lapse telling us that the sun doesn't set in the northern hemisphere, which is good if you're on a, on a globe Earth because, of course, if the sun's just doing a pirouette around the North Pole, that's fine. But the problem is, how do you get a midnight sun on a globe Earth in the southern hemisphere? Because in a globe Earth, You've got a perimeter, and that's all... No, the flat Earth. Sorry, on a flat Earth. Thank you, Gideon. Um, you've got a perimeter. Now, the sun has to be somewhere around the perimeter in order to give light. But how does the South Pole, one particular point, receive 24 hours of sunlight if the sun is rotating around the whole South Pole? If you say that well, this place has to have 24 hours of sunlight. Then on the other side of the South Pole, they have 24 hours of no sunlight. So you can't actually have a midnight sun on a flat Earth. You can't, but here's a video of it. Okay, this guy's down at one of the research stations. I think he's at McMurdo Station. It's 12 o'clock midnight, It's 12 o'clock midnight. Which way is the sun going in this video? It's moving to the left. It's not moving to the right like it did in the northern hemisphere. Okay, I'm not going to keep that going because it just keeps going round and round. Because it took me a while. I sat there going, why is it this way? And why, why is it? And I had to think, okay, that's why we have differences of direction. And that's why these things are observed on the Earth because they fit the globe model. I'm sharing this with you, not because I'm trying to win an argument, but because I love you, and because truth is always helpful, and I think these universal observations are helpful to us to understand truth. People argue whether or not we went to the moon, but less debatable is the fact that we went to the South Pole. Because people have written diaries saying we went to the South Pole, and people perished trying to go to the South Pole. They, were, they, they may have been deceived globe earthers and they may have, um, you know, perished trying to get there, but the question we must answer is, well, what evidence do we have that they left a legacy at the South Pole? Well, we have their diaries that said that they got there and when Roald Amundsen got there a few weeks before Scott, Scott went, oh man, someone got here before me. And that's actually what Roald Amundsen erected when he said he got to the South Pole. Now, the, the, the Flat Earth model has no South Pole because it's all around the outside and there's no particular pole. But on a globe, we have a place where all your lines of longitude meet up. Okay, so Roald Amundsen, his diary, says we arrived here with three sledges and 17 dogs. 
HH, whoever that was, put one down just after our arrival. Helgi was worn out. Tomorrow we will go in three directions to circle the area around the pole. This is around 1910. We have had our celebratory meal, a little piece of seal meat each. We leave here the day after tomorrow with two sledges. The third sledge will be left here. Likewise, we will leave a little three-man tent with an Norwegian flag and a pennant marked friend. Yep. Has anybody heard or read of Ernest Shackleton? Put your hand up if you've heard of Ernest Shackleton. Okay. He was an explorer that went to the South Pole and he tried to cross the South Pole, cross the Antarctic, and he perished. Well, no, he didn't actually. He got, he got uh, shipwrecked. His, his boat got stuck in the ice before he got there. And all the flat earthers go, yes, I knew you couldn't cross the Antarctic because there's a big ice wall that you can't get past. Right? Or that you'll get shot down if you try. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. Because I'm about to show you some tourist companies that take people to the South Pole. So, um, anyway, Shackleton, on New Year's Eve, Frank Hurley's diary reflected the hopefulness that had settled over the ship. Frank Hurley said this, about midnight we crossed the Antarctic circle with a glorious sunset, there's the 24 hour midnight sun, reflecting in the placid waters at midnight, and so entered the geographic Antarctica with the dawn of the new year. Below him stood Shackleton, received, relieved to see the open waters. He knew that the endurance could forge ahead with 24 hours of summer daylight to guide her. Okay, a hundred years ago, people were writing in, the, in their diaries in the southern hemisphere that they had 24 hours of sunlight. How does that work on a flat Earth? How do you get 24 hours of sunlight at the South Pole on a flat Earth? It can happen on a globe Earth, which is tilted toward, because of its um, axis of rotation, it's tilted toward the sun, and the pole just happens to have sun fly, uh, shining on it, whether or not you're on the uh, one side of the South Pole near the sun, or on the far side of the South Pole, away from the sun. Okay, now here's something interesting. I'm going to tell a little story. So Shackleton took 27 men to try and cross the Antarctic. He went down from uh, South Georgia Island, which is near Argentina, and he got to that side of the Antarctic with his 27 men. Uh, they, 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 um, they took the boat down, but the boat got crushed in an ice pack and it got wedged there for about a year. And they lived on the boat waiting for the ice to thaw. During that time, they thought, well, we'll just make ourselves comfortable. But eventually, they discovered that the boat was sinking and getting crushed, and they wouldn't be able to sink, uh, get out. So they took the lifeboats out, and they walked a long way. And then the men were starving and, and struggling. So Shackleton said, look, the only way that we're going to get out of here, they weren't starving, they were eating seal meat, but they were really struggling. They'd just gone through an Antarctic winter. He got one of the lifeboats and there was a guy, there, there was a shipwright and he covered it with uh, seal skins. This is about 20 foot long and I can't remember how many of them, three, four or five of them, got on this little boat down on the Antarctic and they set out to sail to South Georgia Island. That's 1,300 kilometres away. And they, they were going over some of the roughest oceans imaginable. And there was a guy in the boat that was the navigator, and he used a sextant. Does anybody know what a sextant is, or has anybody ever used a sextant? Okay, a sextant basically measures the elevation to a celestial object <laughs> above the horizon. Now, bear in mind that often in the, in, the, um, in the Antarctic, you've got 24 hours of sunlight, so you don't get the stars, you've only got one object to navigate by, and that's the sun. And so you need the sun's elevation together with the time of day. And from that, using a flat earth... Remember, these guys are trying to get to the South Pole. They are globe earthers, <coughs> believing that they're trying to get to the South Pole. So therefore, all their maps, all their geometries, all their algebra, all the trigonometry that they're doing relates to a flat earth. That guy managed to sail them, a globe earth. I keep doing that. All their, all their thinking is the Earth has a South Pole. He got them over 1,300 kilometres through the roughest seas. He says there was umpteen times we thought the ship was going to sink. And people have checked his calculations, and because he wrote them all in the ship's log, 
they were dead on. And he got them to hit this little island in the South uh, Atlantic Ocean. And Shackleton got there. Then they had to, to, to march for 30 kilometres over these massive glaciers and mountains. And he got there, just this dishevelled kind of bloke. And I said, who are you? And he said, you don't recognise me, I'm Shackleton. I saw you like a year ago or two years ago. And I said, we didn't recognise you. He said, well, can you go and pick up my mates? And so they got everyone back from that expedition. 27 men survived nearly two years in the Antarctic. The point is, you may think that the, the Earth is not a globe, but question this. Here's a bunch of people that believe the Earth is a globe and are prepared to give their lives to prove that it's a globe. They are weathering like frozen conditions, getting frostbite, traversing huge places, eating their dogs, eating the seals, whatever they can find they eat, and they bet their lives getting there. And then when they get in the little boat, they use a globe Earth model to find their way across the oceans to South Georgia. Did it work? Yeah, it did. Their model held up. And after that, I'm going to come back to a point on this slide. These, they, like if you look on the internet, there's two blokes in 2018 that did go from one side of the Antarctic to another. One's, one's name was uh, Rudd. Uh, what was his first name? Louis. Lou, Lou Rudd and Colin O'Grady. And separately they traversed the Antarctic going by the South Pole. And they did it on skis alone, without dogs, without kites. They just muscled their way over there and they skied across the Antarctic from one side to the other. One side was below um, the South America and the other side was basically below uh, South Africa or, to, or around that side. So they basically covered the, 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 the two sides of Antarctica. There's, there's a big portion that bulges out to one side that they obviously didn't do. They went the shortest route possible. But what I'm going to do is get back to this diagram here. Now, you can test this. We live in Perth, which is 32 degrees south. That's our latitude in Perth. If you looked at the South Celestial Pole, the area through which the, the celestial hemisphere rotates, and you got a sextant, you don't even need one, you could get a protractor, and you measured that angle, what you could do is you could get a string, and you could put a rock at the bottom of the string, and the, the string will hang down. And then you put the protractor on an angle aiming at the South Celestial Pole, that will be 32 degrees. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere and say you live at 30, uh, 24 degrees north, and you get a sextant, and you, me you measure the elevation to Polaris, the North Star, it will be 24 degrees. The elevation of your axis of rotation equals your latitude at any place on the Earth. And it's because of this. This diagram here, I'll use the little pointer. This diagram here, there's the Earth, the little ball in the middle. There's the axis of rotation. There's the North Celestial Pole at the top. This person here is standing on the Earth there. I don't have very steady hands, I'm sorry. But that's their horizon. This angle here is the equator. That angle there is their latitude. It's the, it's the angle above the equator. If you just do simple... 90 degree completing this, then that's 90 degrees, this is perpendicular, that's parallel, and that also has to equal your latitude. And that only works on a globe Earth. Because if you're on a flat Earth, and you're at the... So, basically, what happens on a globe Earth is when you're standing under the North Star, that's 90 degrees, and that's your latitude, and that will be the angle that the North Star makes with your horizon, 90 degrees. But as you go further south, let's say you're in North America somewhere, that's where the North Star will be. If you're at 40 degrees north, your North Star will be at 40 degrees. But when you get to the equator, where's the North Star? It's on your horizon. Zero, Zero degrees. But on a flat Earth model, if you're under the um, North Star, fine, that's great. The North <coughs> Star's right above you. But when you get to the equator, which is only halfway to the edge of the disk, you don't have zero, you've got about 45 degrees. So at the equator, you should have the elevation of the North Star at 45 degrees, but nobody on the Earth sees that. They see the North Star at zero degrees at the equator. Does that make sense? And you can do the same in the Southern Hemisphere. Just take the, the, the South Celestial Pole, the point around which all the stars rotate, you measure the angle, 
and that will be 32 degrees if you're in Perth because we're 32 degrees south. Now, if you keep going up to the equator, that south celestial pole will be on your horizon. But if you did that on a flat Earth and you went from the outside, if you went from the outside, which is 90 degrees, through Perth, and you got to, to the equator, you'd still only be halfway to the North Pole. And so you should see... Oh, look, I don't even know if it works. It doesn't work because they don't have a South Celestial Pole. You can't, like, you can't actually find a South Celestial Pole on a flat Earth. It doesn't exist. There's no point around which the stars rotate. Okay, just finally. People are offering tourist ventures to the South Pole. Here's one, six or seven days for $92,082. You can get there either from South America or South Africa. It says here, flying to the South Pole for a lucky handful each season, you can fly to the South Pole from either Punta, Punta Arenas, Chile or Cape Town, South Africa, and spend some time in the Union Glacier Camp. Now on a flat Earth, South America is over here, and South Africa is over here. How can you get to the South Pole equally in a short distance from both locations? You can't. You'd have to have two separate South Pole camps. Well, maybe they have made that up. Maybe they've made a South Pole camp over here and a South Pole camp over there. But it sounds a little complicated to me. Um, they've got a base at the South Pole, and I'm just going to show this to you, and I think this is my last video. No, I don't have it. Anyway, you can look it up yourself. The Munson Scott Base at the South Pole. There's, there's umpteen researchers there. They've got a jolly great radio. They've got a telescope there. A Bicep 2. A Bicep 2 telescope. And they're doing heaps of experiments there. And they're all people that believe around Earth. That. Everybody that is involved in this project. In fact, how many people in our generation have been brought up believing the Earth is round? How many still continue to believe that the Earth is round? Probably 99.99%. The question is, how does it all work? And Gideon said this, applied to astronomy, the study of planetary motions, binary stars, moons, uh, comets. I'm just going to bre touch briefly on Jupiter's moons. You know Galileo, when he was observing Jupiter 400 years ago, saw so, uh, Europa, Io, Ganymede and Callisto, the four largest moons of Jupiter, orbiting, circular, like surrounding Jupiter, while Jupiter was moving. It was a good example of what we've got on the Earth and we could see it happening. And we can still see that, well, there's about 70 moons of Jupiter now. They've found lots of little ones. But uh, the, the large, four largest moons are still um, going around Jupiter. Uh, uh, in fact, I think Gideon said to me, there's no object in, in the universe that they've found that isn't rotating. Uh, yeah. Or, and, and, uh, Celestial object? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And any uh, radius larger than 100 kilometres is all spherical. And any radius larger than 100 kilometres is all spherical. What about comets? They're, they're often... They're smaller. They're smaller. Okay. Okay. So... That's the end of my, my, my presentation. I hope um, you found it kind of encouraging. The reason that I'm passionate about this is, we touched on this at the start, three things. Um, distraction, division, and there was a third D, but I'm thinking about, we're, we're getting distracted a lot. By, it's, it's massive. Destruction. It could be destruction. Deception and destruction and division. Now, the Christian body, you may not be a Christian, but the Christian call is to seek and save that which was lost. This scripture just here says that Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. This is the same Jesus that in the beginning was with God when all things were created. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now there are laws in nature, you know them, that's why you don't climb up high objects and jump off. Some people call it gravity, other people might call it the magnetic field. But whatever it is, there are laws in nature 
the sun, moon and stars obey them. God's given them to us for signs and seasons. I believe eclipses and blood moons are symbolic of judgment coming quickly to us. The greatest laws are not physical laws. They're God's spiritual and moral laws. Yeah. And we've all broken them. And the biggest problem is the problems of sin. Yeah. We have all broken God's laws. There is none righteous, no, not one. Yeah. When I was a young doctor working at Fremantle Hospital just over the road, I thought I was a good fella. I was helping people in hospitals. I'd started charities. I thought I was a 75% good person. If I met God, I'd be right. But at the same time, my heart was deceiving me and telling me I was good whilst I was lying, completely self-centered, getting drunk and being a womanizer. And I had to come to the point where I realized I was not a good person and that I needed God's forgiveness. God sent his son into the world, into this little insignificant place to demonstrate love. The condemnation of men is not that we like do bad things, it's that we refuse to come to the light. We do bad things and we try and hide them from God like I was doing and say, God, I'm a good person, but I wouldn't let my heart be exposed to the light of the gospel. But when I said to God, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, please have mercy upon me, I knew that I was forgiven and that God had sent Jesus into the earth to die for me, a sinner. Now, this scripture says, he that believes is not condemned, but he that believes not is not condemned, is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. My question is this, have you come to the light of Jesus Christ? He says, come to me. He who comes to me, I will not send you away. I died for sins. I died to pay for the sins of people, men and women of all nations, of all types, of all ages. Come and be washed in the blood of Jesus. But the condemnation of men is that we, we don't want to take up a cross and follow Jesus. It's just too difficult. We would rather sit in our, in our comfort of our houses, look at endless YouTube videos. But the West wasn't one that way. You've got to bleed a little. And so please come to Jesus for forgiveness and go to Jesus and follow Jesus for eternal life. That's the message of the Bible. And I know that Gideon and I have put a lot of time and effort into this. And we don't care if we don't get a clap. But what we do care about is your souls. And we want you to know that there is a Saviour. His name is Jesus. If you follow him as I have done, and I'm not saying I'm the prototype, I just know that I follow Jesus and he's been good to me. And though I have nothing else to really rest my head upon, very often without a home and without a salary, God has looked after me and I can put my trust in him. And as we go off this world that has gone completely mad, you can put your faith in God who created the world and be safe. And you can turn away from systems and structures that bring people into bondage and you can say, my God has me and he loves me and he gave his son to die for me. That's the Jesus I proclaim to you today. Those who put their trust in him, he will in no wise forsake. He will not forsake you if you put your trust in him and he will keep you until he comes again or until you go to glory. God bless you all. Thank you. Amen.